Hi guys, I have another book review today. So this one's a little bit different because it's the first nonfiction book that I've done a review for. Um, it is called Black Edge and the like subtitle to it is Inside Information, Dirty Money, and the Quest to Bring Down the Most Wanted Man on Wall Street. So this book is essentially about the FBI and the SEC's investigation into Stephen Cohen to try to bring some justice <laughs> to Wall Street, which was rampant with insider training, particularly in hedge funds. So I will say, I really enjoyed this book. I think if you are interested in finance, Wall Street, business, any of the above, um, it's a good read. It's interesting and it kind of gives you an inside look into things that you otherwise may not ever really hear about or know how it's done like the investigations it goes into depth about um wiretapping and what's required to get subpoenas for different documents how difficult it is to get approval to wiretap somebody's phone because it is kind of a serious thing <laughs> to be listening in on all of their conversations um something else along those lines that i thought was interesting was it talking about um having to choose a phone line so one of the things was when they're wiretapping Stephen Cohen, they had to choose which phone line they wanted to tap, and there are more options than you'd think of, because he had his home phone, his office phone, his cell phone, I think there's, like, oh, the house in the Hamptons where he would stay at during the, like, vacation, and it's just the kind of thing that you wouldn't necessarily think about if you're not in that career line or you're not reading something to this effect where it matters, so... I found that interesting and just like a little tidbit, I guess, if anyone cares. Um, it's kind of funny because they actually made the wrong choice on this one. They wiretapped his home in Greenwich and it was while he was staying in the Hamptons. So they missed almost all the phone calls during the time period when they had it and then couldn't get it renewed. So it goes to show that it's not only just like something you don't think about, it's something that's really important because <laughs> that could have majorly affected the investigation if they would have had copies of conversations during that time that they were allowed to have a wiretap and they put it on a phone he was actually using most of the time. So it definitely has a lot of interesting information that you wouldn't necessarily find out, know, or even necessarily know to seek out because even if I was looking into this myself, I don't think I would, I don't think it would come to mind to me to search about things like wiretaps. So I, I would never really find that out um, if it weren't included in this book. So I do think it's a good book. I think it's a nice read. Like I said, if you're interested in these type of topics, um, it goes pretty quickly. It's just an average size book. It's less than 300 pages, I think. There are a lot of references in the back that make it seem longer than it is, just because it is nonfiction. But I definitely would recommend it as like a, a pretty quick read about an interesting topic that I haven't seen a ton about. But I will say, as far as like my own personal opinions on this book go, I loved the beginning of it because one of the most interesting things to me was learning about these people that were being investigated for insider trading, learning about their childhood and like how they grew up, kind of what got them to be in the position they're in now to have these opportunities to make all of this money, but also to be insider trading. Like, I will say, I realized that the main person they're going after was Cohen. But Matthew Martoma, who is involved heavily in the biggest trades that they pursued, um, this book actually spends more time talking about him, I would say, as far as, like, character building, which might sound weird because he's a real person, so it's not like... But you still have to do character building in the book for the reader to, like, understand. And I find him so interesting reading about his childhood, the family he grew up in, and then I won't spoil everything because there'd be no reason for you to read the book, but his, um, his time in law school, 
and his time in business school both are so fascinating to me and you can't help but wonder like all the things that kind of led up to that point and it's like oh, man he still got this really good job and he made all of this money at it obviously related to inside information but like the fact that he was able to get there in the first place to have that opportunity is kind of crazy and <laughs> it's just kind of mind-blowing honestly um it is not a uh, a clean story there is you know poor decisions questionable uh unethical decisions all along the way and I will leave it at that like I said because if you have any interest in reading it then I would be doing you a disservice by telling you what happens although you could totally just google it because it's true but like I say, I want that to be up to you <laughs> as a possible future reader on whether you want to know that stuff ahead of time or just read the book and find out that way. Um, I think the author does a really good job of kind of introducing these characters. I'm just going to call them characters. People. Um, and giving background as to who they are and how they got to where they are. But like I say, that was kind of my favorite part of the book and it's probably only the first quarter to one third that's like that. Um, and then it dives farther into the FBI side of things and the SEC investigation. Um, lots of talk about the attorneys and the investigators trying to find the information needed to build these cases against uh, the company, SAC Capital, and also against the individual players. And it's not all SAC Capital either. They also end up targeting and arresting people from other hedge funds along the way. Um, I'm sorry, I keep saying um, one day. One day I won't do it anymore, but today is not that day. So I'm going to have to deal with it this time around. It's interesting still, but I do think that the, I would say the last third of the book was drawn out longer than I needed it to be. And then when it comes to the actual trials, it's basically like one chapter for one trial, one chapter for another, and you're done. It's all of like 10 pages to go through these trials. And I think it would have been really interesting to hear a little bit more about how that went. I understand that that's probably partially because I don't know what this author's experience with trials and court, how much they know about it. So I definitely understand and respect if that's not necessarily what they're into or what they understand the most or have the most information on. You want to focus on things that you have, facts, actual interviews you can reference, actual true facts so that you don't get into any trouble with embellishing or being unsure of what really happened and then having to write about it in a nonfiction. So that also could be part of it. I think the trials were somewhat close to when she wrote the book I might be mistaken on that but so there are obviously a lot of factors to consider when it comes to writing a nonfiction so with all of that like considered and also the fact that um, as she kind of mentions there were a lot of interviews I believe it said hundreds of interviews with over 200 people so there's a lot of information being gathered and it is not easy to take all of that information and compile it into a readable book that flows nicely. It tells you what you need to know without having any information in there that you're not allowed to share because some of it was under agreements that it wouldn't be attributed to whoever actually told her that. Um, just because the people who are still out there, Cohen actually never had any jail time. He paid a lot of fines, but the amount of money that he has really wasn't necessarily that big of a deal to him. He's still trading. Uh, currently, he's only allowed to trade family funds. I would have to look up to see if that has officially changed yet or changing soon. But he's still out there. He's still considered a very influential figure on Wall Street. So it makes sense that a lot of people doing interviews when talking about crimes <laughs> that are related to him don't necessarily want that information associated with their name, especially if they are still working in the industry. So with all things considered 
and there is a lot to consider I think um, this is a very good book it is a fun and interesting read and it's it feels very relevant despite all of these things being done and finished you know the investigations are pretty much closed at this point I believe it feels very relevant and it is such an intriguing look into Wall Street which is something that most people don't ever really see they don't really get that insight Wall Street is some like it almost feels like an idea more than an actual thing it's like oh Wall Street so I think this is a very interesting way to kind of take a peek inside of that world so two thumbs up I definitely recommend it um, especially if you're just looking for something fun and interesting but not too involved because it's it's very easy to read then I would highly recommend it I would give it probably an 8 out of 10 for you know all the things that I said positive about it but then also all the limitations that kind of come along with writing a nonfiction book about somebody who is still very much alive working influential etc so with all that being said I will move on to my next book that I am reading and I will see you guys next time. Bye guys.